Hi, and welcome to the first episode of the Wayne's World Podcast. This is Wayne's View, that's me, on your Maryland Terrapins and the rest of the sports news around the D.C., Baltimore, and general Maryland area. We're going to start off with Maryland's trip to Temple in Philadelphia, and I have to tell you, the game left me a little flat and a little frustrated. A 2017 loss to the Temple Owls. That game was there for the taking. It was there all day for Maryland to dominate. And as coming as the 21st ranked team in the country, you figured that you could beat a Temple team that had just played Bucknell. That was it for their schedule so far. You're ramped up as number 21. They played a, a minor FCS school. This is Maryland's game. It's there for the Terps. But as we looked at the schedule before the season, this looked like a game that Maryland could lose. After the first two wins, you get over that feeling. You start to drink the Kool-Aid and say, this is going to be something special. Then Maryland goes to Philly, never really gets started. Yeah, there were a few minutes there where the passing game worked. The run game looked pretty good all day. The defense was good enough, but Maryland just couldn't score in the red zone. Now, Mason on the Young Terps podcast pointed out that this looked a lot like what happened to Mike Loxley's Alabama team when they played Clemson for the national championship. And yeah, I can see the similarities there. But look, Maryland's not Alabama. However, when you have the ball in the one-yard line and you need to score, you figure that your near Heisman level backfield of McFarland, then you add in Leak, then you have Jake Funk, one of those guys was going to be able to pound the ball into the end zone somehow. And it just didn't happen. And, and that's the, the upsetting part. We were in the game. Sure, last year we lost to Temple 35-14. to This year we're in the game, but I'm not sure that Maryland's goal here is to be in the game with Temple. So problem number one, the opportunities were there. And when D.J. Turner had a punt return late in the game and he got stopped to the four-yard line, even I thought Maryland's just not going to be able to score. So problem one, couldn't score in the red zone. Now you might ask yourself why. You might not know that the kicker, Joseph Petrino, pulled his groin on the first field goal that he attempted, a 43-yarder that went wide. After that, it was Paul Inzarello. He wears the number 38 jersey. He stepped in on the kickoffs. He tried one extra point. It was blocked. So, so far, he was 0 for 1 on the day. I guess Loxley just did not want to trust him with the actual field goal duties. But if you look back at the red zone opportunities, if Maryland kicks two or three field goals, they have the lead. And, of course, many of you know that if you have the lead when the game's over, you usually win. So would you have taken a 21-20 win at Temple? Sure. Would you have been overly excited? No, but at least you got the win. So problem two, there wasn't a backup kicking plan. Let's go to problem number three. Most of the day, Temple brought a ferocious outside rush. They beat the tackles. They beat Tayon Fleet Davis, who came in as a blocking tailback. And at the height of his drop, which means as far away from the line of scrimmage as Josh Jackson would set, the rush was getting to him. Should he have stepped up once or twice and made those edge rushers stop and turn? Sure, that could have helped. But the general counter to a pure outside rush like Temple was bringing is to run a draw, is to run a middle screen to the tight end, is to have a quarterback draw built in there. Maryland did not go with the counters. They stayed with the RPO. I know it's an RPO offense, but often in this game, that RPO made the wrong choices. So before we get too far into the RPO, let's go with problem number three. Maryland did not counter the ferocious pass rush in a way that was effective on Saturday. Do I think it's in Loxley and Scotty Montgomery's bag of tricks? Sure I do. But on this Saturday, Maryland did not go with those play calls. So that, that sort of gives your play calling a C- minus at best. Move on to the RPO. One of the reasons the teams run the RPO is that there's decisions to be made when that defense comes out and when you go to snap the ball. It is a lot like a triple option look, except it's a run, a quarterback run, a handoff run, or a pass. 
usually you're reading the rush end. If the rush end crashes down in the same way that uh, a pistol offense like West Virginia ran under Dana Holgerson, you make your choices right then and there. For the first two weeks, Josh Jackson was spectacular in this. On Saturday, not so much. I thought he locked on to receivers early. I thought he made up his mind before the ball was snapped. And at that point, he was stuck with it. Uh, a couple times, especially when the rush got to him, I thought Josh's eyes dropped, picked up the rushers, and then lost track of the wide receivers. When he goes back to make the throw after he reacquires the vision, that's one of Randy Etzel's favorite terms, eye discipline, but it, just because Randy said it doesn't mean it's wrong. Once he reestablishes eye contact, he didn't pick up on some of the underneath coverage. A lot of the coverage is called a buzz, which is the cornerback or linebacker comes under the play, plays from the inside hip of the receiver back towards the quarterback, and that's why they got the hands on the ball so many times. Josh didn't have great recognition of that. He threw the ball shoulder height and gave the defender time to get in front of that and knock it down. There were a couple times where it was a zone drop. The linebackers were dropping. Josh was under pressure. He didn't reacquire where the defense had dropped to, made his usual throw, and it hits off the hands of the defenders. In one sense, Maryland was lucky that there weren't three or four interceptions. In another sense, once he saw that his throws were coming in front instead of leading the receiver, you were hoping that he was going to make the adjustment and throw more of the open space and let the receiver go get the ball. So, once again, not a major problem. It's correctable, but the accuracy and the placement of the ball on Saturday was not ideal. So we can look at the good parts. The running game was pretty good. I think, other than the fact they didn't score a touchdown, McFarlane and Leak both looked great. I wasn't so happy that Jake Funk didn't get a carry near the end or he didn't get split out on an option toss, tried to score inside the one. Once again, correctable. The defense, other than giving up a few big plays, was pretty much spot on. They got the turnovers, they gave Merrill a chance, they kept him in the game. You have some trouble when the quarterback's feet are clean, and we saw it against Syracuse the four times that they dropped back and, and there was no pressure on the quarterback, he had four long passes. On Saturday, Russo, when he had a very clean pocket, did similar. The two long passes were enough to do in the Terps on Saturday. Now, you take a step back, and that's hard for me because I'm all in on this, but you take a step back and you say, if you had that many chances inside the 20 with an offense, you feel has this many tools that we didn't talk about Mabry, we didn't talk about Chigaconquo, Daryl Jones, Dante Demas, Brian Cobbs, Sean Savoy, Sean Nelson, Carrier. There, there's a lot of guys that we didn't really focus on in this segment, but you have big receivers. You can score the ball. We just saw you put up 79 and 63 points. So in a normal circumstance, I figured that Maryland was good for about 30 points. They came out with 15, well, 13. 13 offensive points. There was a botched snap on a punt for a safety, and then Temple takes a safety at the very end, and that gets you to 17. The offense got two touchdowns, missed an extra point, not good enough to win, and then you look forward. You have this bye week. Maryland's already out recruiting. They already got one recruit out of Western Maryland, and all of this focus goes to hashtag beat Penn State. Now, for me, hashtag beat Penn State is good 365 days a year for about the past 50-plus years. That's really all I want out of life is to beat Penn State. It's completely taken over the beat Duke. I don't really feel that there's a rivalry with any other Big Ten team. You can see one building with Minnesota, but it's not nearly where beat Penn State is for most of the Maryland faithful. So we hope everything gets put back together. We know we lost Terrence Davis at guard for a few weeks. Petrino's got the leg injury. Everybody else looks healthy enough. You should have 100% of Shaq Smith when the clock turns to next Friday night, 8 o'clock. It's a blackout in College Park. And here's to all you Terp fans who are living and dying with this team. I actually expect to beat Penn State next Friday night. This is Wayne Viner for the Red Turtle Production Network. You can hear me on the Sports Maven and Turp Talk, both brought to you by Coons Ford on 1300 CBS Sports Radio in Baltimore. And you can hear me on the post-game show after every Maryland game with Mike Popovic 
on 105.7 The Fan and 980 AM Redskins Radio in Washington, D.C. We'll see you on the radio.